I am Anna Seewald, and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm, connection, and joy in parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. As you may already know, as a long-time listener that once in a while, occasionally now, I have a special episode where I am joined with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Laura Froyan, and we get to answer your parenting questions, share some parenting stories from our lives, and some resources that we found helpful, useful, or enjoyable. Laura, welcome back to the show. Hi, Anna. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Laura Froyan. I have my PhD in human development and family studies with a specialization in couple and family therapy. I host my own podcast now, thanks to Anna getting me introduced um, to the format. I love it. Um, It's called The Balanced Parent. Um, So I hope you come over and join me there. Um, But I'm so excited to come back for another special episode. I love getting to answer these questions with you, Anna. I know. And our listeners do as well. And our last episode, I have to say, did very well. I got a lot of feedback. I think it was episode 238, if I'm not mistaken. It's called How to Get Your Children to Listen and Cooperate, when, where we talked about control, yeah. inf- influence, unworthiness, and all of the good stuff. It resonated with a lot of parents. I got a lot of feedback. And so I want to thank you for always showing up and sharing your wisdom and being my friend on this podcast. Oh, absolutely. I I believe that as parents and just individuals, we're not supposed to do this alone. And that goes like from business to raising our kids to just trying to be better people. Like we always need the people in our lives to support us. So I'm happy to team up with you and support parents in that process. So what's going on in your life? Do you have any story to share with us? Yeah, you know, I I think I've been, something that I've been focusing on a lot in my parenting right now is not letting mistakes or, you know, grumpy moods or kind of negative interactions between me and my kids or between the kids and, you know, between the the siblings like ruin the rest of the day. Like I've been really working hard on focusing on like letting it go when something negative happens. So just this morning, um, my oldest daughter was kind of complaining about her breakfast. She didn't really like the way the eggs were cooked and there wasn't enough feta and the feta was too melted in, you know, she just had a kind of a, a list of complaints. And in the process, she kind of was being a little grumpy and we all are grumpy in the mornings and stuff, you know? Um, and so we had this kind of like negative interaction and she was just, it ended with like, just stop talking to me. And I was like, okay, I'll just stop talking to, you know, to her. And about 10 minutes later, she came like running up, like wanting to play. She was super silly and goofy. And it was clear that she wanted to make up and let it go. And it could have been, I could have taken that moment to be like, no, Ellie, we had to talk about the way you spoke to me. And, you know, I didn't like that. You know, how do you like your eggs? Like, how can I make them better next time you like and get into it? But she was over it. It was done. It was passed. And we didn't need to let that kind of like negative interaction taint the rest of our day, the rest of our morning. And so I let it go. I didn't say anything about it. And that's hard for like, for me, I'm a like, by nature, I'm a controlling (laughs) person. And I also, by nature, I don't like things to be left kind of unresolved in my mind. So I will like pick and prod and like pursue an issue with my (laughs) husband or with my parents or with my kids, you know, until it's settled and complete. And I've really been learning to understand that for some people it is settled and complete for her. It was over. It was done with, she'd released her grumpiness and it was done and we didn't need to go back to it. She knows not to speak to me in a grumpy way. If she could have not spoken to me in a grumpy way, she wouldn't, like she wouldn't have. Like she, at that point in time, she didn't have it in, in her and 
and then she was ready to move on. And so I let her move on and we had some really fun time playing. And then she and her dad went off on a hike and it was over and it was done with, and it didn't need to taint our day. And I like, I think that that's something that I've been working really hard on for myself. Um, and I don't know, I thought other people can benefit from that. <laughs> Absolutely. We have talked about this on the podcast before, especially, I think we had a, a great guest, KJ Delantonia, the author of How to Be a Happier Parent. And she talks about this too in her book. And I mentioned this many times in, in my episodes. Don't let your children's mood you know, color the entire day or don't absorb their mood, right? Because it's temporary, like you said, don't engage. I feel like as parents, we always want to, I guess that's the sense of being in control. Uh, we want to respond to every word, every sentence our children say, and we want to make it better or we want to fix it. We want to change their mood. We want to make it perfect. The breakfast has to be suitable for them. But sometimes you know, you, you're you making a big deal out of it. If you do focus on those small things, these are the children who become uh, laser focused on magnifying negative aspects of life and things. So letting go, not engaging, not absorbing their negative mood is great. But also I think what I do with my kid, which also has similar tendencies. I think it's just a kid thing, right? Or maybe a human thing. What's great about this, right? Reframing, like for, mm. for a child. Okay, I sometimes joke and say, okay, you mentioned like 10 things that are wrong with this <laughs> dish or with this shirt or whatever we with this activity. Can you say something like positive about this? Is there something good about this experience or about this food? Trying to shift the mood or her lens to see that, you know, you can hold negative and positive at the same time in your mind and things mm -hmm. uh, are not negative as they seem that they are. So helping my daughter reframe, it's not always successful, I have to be honest, but hopefully over time, she will adopt this mindset and this philosophy. And, yeah. and she, she always says, mom, not everybody's like you, so happy and positive all the time. <laughs> You know, so that's, oh, she that's, sounds very angsty. <laughs> Do you have a, any stories to share with us about what's been going on in your life? My life has been pretty good because my daughter goes to summer camp. <laughs> uh, you know, I my daughter is also twelve, FYI. So she's very self-sufficient, self-organized, very independent, you know, in fact, sometimes a little too much, you know, she, she can, she can start and do things without asking and only post factum, you know, that she has done something, but we didn't have any frictions or, you know, but there are sometimes eye rolls, looks, you know, sassy attitude, trying to assert her power. You're not going to tell me, you know, to practice piano right now if I don't want to, that mm -hmm. kind of attitude, mm -hmm. which, which, yeah, kind of. which is, which is fine. I, I, you know, I welcome that and I don't squash that. And in fact, we have several questions today about that. And maybe I will inject some of my own a little tips and stories. Yeah, that sounds good. Why don't we answer our listener questions? We yeah. have several. Yeah. All right. So um, let's start with, um, sorry, Ro. do you want to do the nice girls one or do you want to start with the one on? Um... We can do the nice girl one. Okay. Yeah. All right. So our first question is asking about raising nice girls and at the same time, making sure that they're mentally strong. Um, so it seems like this person is kind of trying to figure out a balance between kind of some of the messages that we all got growing up that we shouldn't be a tattletale, um, you know, that we need to be helpful. We need to make people comfortable, but at the same time, like how do we raise girls that are going to stand up for themselves? Um, too. So do you have any thoughts on this right off the bat? Yes. Well, the first thing I would say for me, when I read this, I don't want to raise a quote unquote, nice girl, eliminate that from my vocabulary and from my mind completely, because 
if I want to, you know, this woman says she wants to raise a nice girl, but making sure they are mentally stronger. I think these two concepts, it's an oxymoron for me. Nice (laughs) girls and strong mentally don't go together. So I would say, change how you think about this. You know, what does a nice girl mean? People pleasing, listening, Mm -hmm. obeying, you know, your needs don't matter, but I don't want to raise that kind of kid. So that notion for me does not exist. Do I want to raise a mentally strong kid? Yes. I want to raise a a strong individual who believes in herself, in her value, in her worth, who can exercise her voice in my own home, even if it's even, and especially when it's not aligned with my own ideas and my own opinions. So I want to welcome that in my own household. And I think I'm doing it to the best of my ability. You know, sometimes it's frustrating as a parent. You just want to say, just shut up and listen to me. (laughs) <laughs> but, but I want to encourage that uh, uh, sense of agency, you know, ownership, responsibility, right? And so it's hard if you want to raise a mentally strong, as this woman says, child. You have to deal with those frustrations. A lot going to show up for you personally. And so I don't know. We'll see in the future how successful we raised our children. But (laughs) my main thing is not to squash her spirit, not to say, do as I said so. I always welcome her opinion. What do you think about this? What makes you think that? I always ask questions from a simple purchase or school-related questions. For example, they sent us questionnaires, right? Surveys about going back to school. And we included our daughter in the process Mm -hmm. because she's the one who is going to go to school. As much as I am as a parent for all remote learning, my daughter does not want to do all remote learning. She chose the hybrid model. And guess what? I filled out the application with the hybrid model. And she said to me, mom, I'm so thankful that you're my mom. Six Mm. of of my friend's moms didn't even ask their opinion. They just chose for themselves. It starts from simple choices like that, right? Mm -hmm. Including our child in the questions, in the matters that relate to them. Or if they have opposing thoughts or opinions about things, allowing them to express and, and yeah. sometimes they do use mean words and curse words as they get older. <laughs> so we have to get comfortable with that as well. And I know we have several questions about this, but I want to hear what you have to say about this. Yeah, I, I think it was really important what you said about letting go, like getting clear on what we mean by a nice girl and letting go of maybe conventions and old ideas about what how we're supposed to raise girls. Because the way that, I don't know about you, but certainly the way I was socialized, I was socialized not to make people uncomfortable, to put my needs after others, to be a people pleaser, to get the people who were more powerful than me, um, approving of me. And all of these things, I think, put our our girls and our kids at risk of um, not being happy, not be, being fulfilled, not starting to not trust themselves um, and losing their intuition. And I think that that's why so many of the parents I work with have such a hard time feeling confident in themselves um, because they've spent their whole lives learning not to listen to themselves, to subvert their desires and their needs and their wants. Especially Um, women, especially women. Especially women. women. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and men too, men, like boys get the message to push their feelings down that the only feeling that's acceptable is um, anger or happiness. And I mean, we, we do this to our kids. So really like understanding, like, what do you mean by nice girl? Now, On the flip side, I do want my kids to be kind and compassionate and treat others with the dignity and respect that they want to be treated with. I absolutely believe in those things, but not at their own expense, right? And so, and how do you, how do you teach a kid to do that? You let them practice. You let them practice asserting themselves and asserting, you know, what they need and having an opinion and giving them choices. And you accept that they're learning so that they might ask for their needs to be met in ways that are not so kind, right? And so they need coaching and support and, you know, and validation, like your needs are important. I want to help you make sure you're getting your needs met. Maybe next time you can try asking this way, you know, and Mm -hmm. that might 
make it easier for someone to say yes to you. And And treating them with the same kindness and the compassion that you want them to treat others. I think it it, it just begins by experiencing that. There's no other way of teaching our children to be kind. It's not like, sit down, kid, I'm going to teach you how to be kind. You know, there's no lesson. You treat your child kindly the way you want them to treat others. I think they internalize that and they give it to others. Right. And right. Right. Kid, like all people, we only know what we know. And if we want our kids to know how to be kind, then they have to know what it feels like to be treated with kindness, right? They have to know that in their bones. They have to know this feels right. This feels good because the, what they f- experience in childhood is what's going to feel like love as they grow too. Like it, it's so important that we understand that our behavior is really setting the stage for their future relationships and their future behavior too. Yes. Great. And understand um, that they're young and have low self-regulation abilities and they're inexperienced in learning. So they're going to make lots of mistakes, just like we'll make mistakes because we're also learning in a human. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Let's move on to our second question, which is about setting limits. How to start setting limits when they haven't been enforced in the past? And she says, when things have gotten so much out of control, where to start first? This is a good mm-hmm. question. It and, is. Then, and then there is a, a point about handling fights between siblings. They're explosive, super mean. They say hurtful things to one another. Everyone hates you. And that's basically the gist of this question, yeah. I think, right? Let's take the first part because I have some yeah, I Yes, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah. If you're starting to realize that you've been permissive in the past, that you maybe haven't been setting limits that are important to you or holding boundaries that um, are important for their own safety or just for the kind of the flow and happiness of your home, I think sitting down and having a meeting about that and finding out how they feel about it um, and making a plan together as a family for how to move forward. And in that meeting at some point, uh, there should be an apology from the parents. I like some acknowledgement of like, you know what, I should have been setting you up for success more. Like I I should have been holding these boundaries. I should have been doing these things and I haven't been, and I want to change that. And so now I want to talk about how that can look as a family, but you can do that collaboratively. You know, like you can even acknowledge like, you know, we tried timeouts when you were younger, we've been doing reward charts. And now if I want you to do something, I just take away screen time. And I'm not, I don't love that. That doesn't feel good to me. What can we like, let's find out a different way so that everybody in our family can get their needs met and feel good and safe and connected without, you know, yelling or fighting, you know, like what, just, and just open a conversation. Your kids probably don't like it either. It, you know, is the, they probably don't feel good or comfortable or, you know, if the home is kind of chaotic and out of control either. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yes. Similar, uh, similar thoughts. Uh, So I would say if you haven't set limits in the past, don't worry. There is always a new day. I think parenting is one of those things that you can practice a new, you can always start a new. And uh, there's actually a good quote. I have it in my welcome letter when I give it to my clients. It says, nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. So, you know, you can always start anew. You can start setting limits, but not in the moment, right? If you haven't set a limit about screen time and your child has, you know, abused screen time, don't go in the moment and start setting limits out of a blue unprepared, haphazardly, that's going to backfire. I think what parents need to know about setting limits, and we have done, I have done a fantastic episode, Coaching Call, How to Set Effective Limits. It's one of the recent episodes. I can't remember the, ty- uh, the number, but it's a step-by-step process and you have to be prepared. Do a little work ahead of time. And, and like you suggested, you, you can even have a conversation with, with your children, you know, and say, I have tried that. It never worked. But, but here is what we're going to do. But you need to have a plan. You mm-hmm. need to know what you're going to do. You know, you can't just say, you know what? We haven't set limits in the past, but now today you're not going to use your iPad. And the 
that's today. When tomorrow comes and you have no rules or you have a completely weird rule, <laughs> right? If you are that kind of a parent, like this wishy-washy attitude about setting limits, I encourage that parent to listen to that episode because I spoke about values. You need to know your parenting goals and your mm -hmm. core values. Why are you setting the limits? You need to know the why. And there is a step-by-step -step process of setting a limit. So if you haven't said in the past about the specific thing, it's not a lost opportunity. You can start again, but it can't be unprepared and haphazard. Yeah. And you right? also can't expect your kids to be too happy about it. Sure. Like they don't have to <laughs> like your limits. <laughs> um, they might have lots of big feelings and they also might not trust you. So if you've been maybe setting limits and letting them go um, or setting them inconsistently, or setting with harshness, like yeah, or like you, uh, you only mean it when you're yelling, like so yeah, you say, yeah, like do this, do this, do this, and then yell, and that's finally when they do it. They that's a trust issue. They don't mm -hmm. trust that you mean it when until yeah. you're yelling, or yeah. or if you set a limit and you don't follow through and help them follow through, then they don't trust you. So there's there's trust to be built back there, and tr that trust is built back by you firmly holding a limit with love and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. But letting them come to trust you, come, come to know. So like, just like when we get into a roller coaster and the bars come over our shoulders, maybe it's a roller coaster that goes upside down, right? Those bars that come over your shoulders. I don't know anybody who like doesn't pull up on those bars. Like, do you do that? Like, when, like test the bar just yes. to make sure like, it's yeah. locked, right? All right? That's what your kids are going to do that, right? So if you haven't <laughs> been setting limits, the limits come on. They're like, whoa, we got to make sure that these are here to keep me safe. They're going to push them and test them. And, and it's okay. It's okay to do that. They don't have to like our limits. They yes. can have all the feelings that they need to have about yes. the limits. I mean, I've carried kicking, screaming kids away from the street, you know, who are trying to go in the street and they can't, you know, I've carried kicking and screaming kids to the car, you know, like it's, it's part of it, right? So maybe this can lead to our next question about mean words, hateful words, yeah. which was part of this question. But we also have another question. When siblings say mean, hurtful things to one another, not necessarily physically mean, mm. but when, you know, verbally mean. And uh, I, maybe we can read the two questions together. The one about the mother taking it personally. I think it's from Julie and the other one from Anna, the question about siblings mean words. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll put them together. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. Okay. All right. So yeah, we have this question, a couple of questions about, um, about unkind words, um, particularly when they're directed towards the parent or towards siblings. One person says, I'd, I would be interested in setting limits on unkind words and teasing between si sitting, siblings. When it's about hitting, it's clear to me that I can physically stop it, but I find the unpleasant words much more difficult. And then um, we also have one about what to do when your kids keep calling you names. It's almost entertaining at this point, but seriously, the B word, meanie, rude, annoying, all of those kind of things. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on, on the mean kind of unkind language, either between siblings or directed towards parents? L let me say between the parents first. Um, I think as we spoke in the beginning of our, uh, of our, before we pressed record, when our children are young, around age four or five, they discover the first uh, sort of benign mean word, poopy head. <laughs> and I've never met any kid who never use, uses that word, right? So it's, and as they get older, the words get harsher, quote unquote, you know, stronger. They, they more use, sophisticated. More, more sophisticated. Yeah. As they developments of, get sophisticated and their language acquisition, you know, the words become more adult-like and, and it reflects their development. I think that we have to understand and accept that. Uh, now, it could be very hard for a parent to hear mean words directed towards them. I, I have to say I'm not one of those parents. For whatever reason, it doesn't annoy me to that degree. Like, I, I don't like facial expressions when ro rolling eyes of that nature. That annoys me more than the words mm. uh, for whatever reason. But 
I think accepting that it's part of development. Second, not taking it personally as much as possible. However, there's a parent who is taking it personally, clearly. What, what's the hurt that's showing up for this parent mm. uh, from the past? Maybe she grew up in, in a verbally abusive household and overly critical, judgmental. And so when she hears those words, it's sort of a trigger. And she gets lost. She doesn't know what to do. It becomes a personal issue. Uh, it, this topic comes up a lot in our uh, during our support calls. We have another father whose son calls him the N word. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like very. It could be emotionally charged. Uh, different words can bring up a lot of emotion in in different parents, depending your relationship with that particular word. What kind of history you have with that word, right? Yeah. But again, not engaging with our children on the same level, on a kid-like level and responding as a hurt child. You know, when you're hurt and you're responding as a hurt child back to your child, you're losing your role, your leadership as a parent. And so it becomes a battle of two kids and, Mm -hmm. you know, your child sort of takes advantage of that. And so it's a disempowerment for you. You're going to fall into that trap again and again. What do you have to say? Yeah. So I have a few thoughts and I want to say them out loud and then go through them. So first is understanding what we actually can control around our kids, like where we can actually set limits, understanding that we have like that we can give power to things that shouldn't have power that don't need to have power. Um, And then Uh, recognizing like when these things are an indication of the need for deeper personal inner growth and work, um, inner healing. So I tend to be sensitive to my kids calling me names or my kids being unhappy with me or calling me a bad mom. This has to do with my own personal experiences as feeling unworthy of love as a child, unless I was perfect. So the message that I got unintentionally from my parents, my parents are wonderful, loving parents, but the message I got was that you're lovable when you're perfect. And so when my kids reflect back to me that I'm not a perfect mom, it gets at this deep wound within me that I'm working on healing and I'm aware of. But in those moments, when I start believing what they say, because I'm like, the wound has made it very believable in my head that when someone says I'm a mean, like bad mom, or I don't love you, or I hate you, I'm never going to love you again. Like those things are believable to my inner child. My inner child is like, yep, that's true. You are a bad mom. You know, like my inner, like my inner child is very easily convinced of those things. And so when that's happening, if I'm not aware and conscious and comforting of my inner child and have like a firm sense of self of like, nope, I'm not a bad mom. I don't need to be perfect to be lovable. Like all of those things, then I get really triggered and really pulled into it. And it's a disaster for everyone. Just like you're saying, I lose my power. I like, I start acting like a child, um, a hurting child, and it's not good for anybody, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really important to be aware of like, if what our kids are saying to us are triggering a wound, it is not on them to stop triggering the wound. It's on us to start healing the wound. And that I think is so important because we can't expect our kids to modify their behavior just to make us more comfortable as human beings. It's not their job. They, they're have displaying age appropriate human behavior that imperfect people display. Like, a, yeah. like you they know. test, as I always say, they learn new words. They want to test how it sounds and where, yes. it's, where it's the sa- safest place is home. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's a curiosity. They learn new words. They want to use it, a new curse word, or sometimes they want to use it because it gives them this sense of power or I am a big kid now. I can use this kind of language, right? They have different mm-hmm. purposes. The why for children to use these words is, and sometimes they know that these words hurt and they use Use it to inflict pain on purpose, especially with siblings. <laughs> they do, right? Right, and so and then th- this is the thing that, like, the, this is the two power things. Like, what goes into our kids' bodies and what comes out of their bodies are two things that we don't have any control over. Like, we can't. Like, the only way to make them stop 
using language is by covering their mouth or gagging them. Like, or washing it with soap and vinegar. But even that doesn't prevent <laughs> the words from coming out. I had, I a, know. I had a friend yeah. whose mom would do that to her. Oh and my she gosh. Would call her bitch the whole time. <gasps> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> wow. The whole time. I, I, it's, it's, Listen, I've heard about this technique, but I've never heard people using it. Oh, so it was very popular in my hometown growing up. It would never happen to me, but <laughs> no, it was wow. not. And it doesn't, it still doesn't keep the words coming out. Like there's literally nothing we can do as parents beyond covering our kids' mouths. And even then, like they can still say it with their eyes. <laughs> you know? Oh, yes. Oh, so, yes. So, I mean, like really understanding where your power is in this situation. And like, it's pointless to set a firm limit that you can't enforce. And you can't enforce that limit. You can set a different limit, like, if you're going to call me those names, I'm not going to want to be around you. And so I'm going to take myself to my room, you know, like mm -hmm. that's a limit you can't enforce. Yeah. That's a boundary you can't enforce. Um, but it, then, it, oh. it also, it depends on the situation. Sometimes, as I say, you can use humor too. Depends oh, yeah. on your child, the type of child that you have. Uh, like I sometimes diffuse that with, with humor when she says you are, uh, you know, such a mom or mean mom or whatever, whatever language she uses or the B word or the, you know, F word or a middle finger I've received lately. I, I can joke around with that. If she says, I hate you, I'm like, oh, I'm going to love you even more. And I can go and, and be obnoxious a little bit. You know, that dissolves it. She, I get a smile and she's like, I'm sorry, mom. But what that does is it shows you know? her that yeah, and this is the other I don't power give thing. power to, yeah. to, to what she says, you exactly. know? Exactly. It shows her that what she's saying has no power over you. Like, we get to decide what is powerful, what we take in, what we let it let in, and what we let affect how we see ourselves. So I have a funny story about this. One time when my, my oldest was maybe five, she was really mad at me. And she's calling me every bad name she could think of. You know, meanie, rude, like, she was calling me everything. <laughs> And then she goes, oh, mom, you're such a banana sticky fingers. <laughs> like she just made it like she couldn't get any more bad words out. So she made something up. <laughs> and we've all like looked at each, each other around like around the table because this was happening at the dinner table. And we all just burst out laughing. But like that's like banana sticky fingers like can mean something. But like the, you know, the B word, the F word, those don't mean anything more than banana sticky fingers. Agree. Yes. Something that has been really helpful for me, like when my daughter is mad, like I don't even hear the word she say, mo like most of the time. When she's calling a name, because she can be explosive, like that's, we're working on it. It's, it's all getting better. But like when she's mad and she calls me a name, like I don't hear it. I hear her saying, I'm hurting. I'm anxious about going back to school and I'm lashing out. I'm mad that I'm not getting my way. Like all, that's all I hear. Her words, when she's, you know, says a like mean phrase to me, like it goes one ear in one ear as like, mommy, you're the worst mommy ever. And it, in my brain, it just magically shifts to, I'm having a really hard time right now. And that's what I hear. You know, like that's a good, that's a good suggestion, a good strategy, a technique, I, I think not to pay attention to what's being said, but just responding, res re responding to the feeling, trying to mm -hmm. see why is she saying this? Is she hurting or she's trying to get control or is she, you know, what's going on for, for this child? Yeah. That's, exactly. that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when it comes to be between siblings too. I have do, do your daughters, do your daughters say uh, mean things to each other? Are they at that age already? Oh, sure. Yes. And so this is the <laughs> thing that between siblings, I think when kids are younger and have less self-regulation, we see more hitting and squat, like squat, like get it getting physical more. Right. Mm -hmm. As I get older, especially for girls, because girls are socialized to fight verbally as opposed to physically. As it, so as kids get older, then the fighting happens much more verbally. And my five-year-old still is more prone to uh, like a quick smack if her sister is kind of in her face. Um, but her sister has really mastered the art of a well-placed jab, you know, at, <laughs> at her sister. And so, yeah, absolutely it happens. But I, 
when the verbal stuff is happening, I don't see it as any different than when the hitting is happening. It's just a more well-regulated and sophisticated form of fighting. And the response is still the same. Sep, you know, separate, slow it down, connect with each one, uh, come to understand what's happening. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I hear some mean words being thrown at each other. What's going on? Oh, you wanted to do this. And then, oh, and she, she wasn't doing this. And that made you mad. I hear you. Okay. And you didn't want to do it that way. You wanted to do it this way. Okay. All right. What are we going to do? And then by then, usually they have an idea and they're off playing again. So it's, I mean, it's, the words are, they're saying the words because they're mad at each other. So focusing on the stuff, again, it's the same thing, what's underneath. And I will also coach each of my kids individually to understand that, you know, when she says this, she's saying it because she's feeling this, you know, and, and help them understand. Do, do you ask the child who is being called a name how they feel that does it affect them um usually or not i remember being called mean names by my cousin who was a couple of years older than me we used to play and i remember you know at some point it, it wouldn't bother me anymore like i knew we were quote unquote like friends we were cousins we were friends but but it didn't affect me as much i think sometimes when parents see it from outside did they want to stop it because they see this behavior, the unkind language, they want to stop it. But uh, I'm wondering, does it affect the child deeply? Do you have to interfere when it's affecting the child deeply when they have feelings or like, what's your take on this? Do you yes. know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So we've done a lot of coaching with our kids too on this topic. So usually they understand that the person is just angry and is speaking out of anger and doesn't mean what they're saying. Um, so with my little one, most of the time, her primary feelings have to do with worry and sadness that her sister doesn't want to play with her any, or is not going to want to play with her anymore. You know, her, her big sister is like, the light of her life, you know, like she only wants to spend time with her big sister. And the, the older one never gets called. I mean, the younger one doesn't call the older one names, you know? Yeah. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know, but like the most of their fights have to do with figuring out how, like how to have play together, figuring out how mm -hmm. to come up with the game. And my older one will call my younger one stubborn, which is like <laughs> the biggest insult <laughs> that she can come up with, I think. <laughs> and even though like we talk in our family, like being stubborn is a good thing. Like we all see stubborn as a good thing, but I don't know. Anyway, mm. <laughs> I feel it, like it, I got off track, but in I, my neighborhood, uh, just to, to, to add to this in my neighborhood, uh, my daughter came and she said, mommy, there is this boy, we call him banana face. I'm like, great. And then my daughter doesn't have a sibling. Now I have to deal with the neighborhood kids. <laughs> you know, I, I start become curious. I don't want to mm. say, stop that. Don't say that. That's mean. That's rude. Why do you say that? Why do you ridicule? Because that's not going to stop my kid, right? Kids pick on other kids. The older ones always pick on the younger ones. So do I want my child to be a bully or other kids? No. So I can have a conversation and say, you know, does it upset him when you guys call him banana face or they do the L sign in their forehead with their fingers? Oh my God, is that still a thing? That's still <laughs> a thing. Yeah. So there is these things that I observe in my, you know, in the neighborhood here among kids. And, you know, I don't usually say stop that, don't do that. But I try to say, how would you feel if somebody did that to you? Mm. Or how do you think he's feeling? Sort of perspective taking, more empathy inducing type of conversation. But I know for sure I can't stop kids calling each other banana face in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, I think like part of it to the, we have to understand where our, like whose problem is it too? Like if our kids are, you know, obviously we want to help our kids have empathy and be kind and grow up to be good humans, right? Of course we want those things. But if they are having difficulties, like difficult social interactions, if they are being rude to friends or kids in the neighborhood, like we have to understand where our, like is, whose problem is that? Like, and where, what is our role in that problem? Because we can't, 
get in the middle of all of their peer interactions. We can't take responsibility for their behavior Mm -hmm. um, in that way. We can hold space for them. We can ask them to reflect. We can get curious with them. Um, We can encourage them, but like, we can't make them be, you know, like polite. So yeah, I don't know. Like we just, I think like sometimes we have to let, and oftentimes parents, I think get really attached to their kids' behavior with peers and stuff because it, they, it reflects on us. We, it's, it's again, the, your, their self-worth. It's your yeah. self, self-image. Like mm-hmm. this uh, one mom came to fight with me uh, last year because of that L sign. Mm. You know, your daughter and another kid did the L sign to my son. And, and this little boy went home and told mommy, mommy came to fight with me. Yeah. I, I said, I'll speak with my daughter, which I did. But, you know, I apologize for my daughter's behavior and all of that. But, you know, I didn't say, hey, you know, my kid, I can't control my kid. She did that. And why did your son come to you? He can do the L sign back to my kid, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes the stakes are very low. Parents mm-hmm. can magnify it by interfering it. Right. Right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, I think like it's, we can absolutely help our kids take responsibility, sit in a vulnerable moment of acknowledging a mistake um, that they hurt someone's feelings. Like that's a very hard thing to do. Many adults, you know, the couples that I work with, they are challenged to do that, to sit in a place of understand, like that vulnerable place of recognizing that they hurt someone that they care about. It's it's hard. It's so much harder for our kids to do. Um, we can support them in doing that, um, and without shaming them and blaming them or judging them, um, bringing compassion to that moment so that they can own a mistake and express true regret and remorse and make amends. Um, but we can't force that, and we certainly can't make that happen in a way that's authentic if we are blaming and shaming them with it. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm reading the rest of this question. And it seems like we also addressed that. She says, my eight-year-old is having social troubles, uh, mm. uh, being mean to the other girls on our block. <laughs> yeah. So, so we sort of, um, you know, address this without even reading the question fully. She says, my husband and I have had uh, try to talk with her, but she doesn't want to hear it or do anything about it. I'm not sure what she means when she says talk about it like patronizing talk moralizing lecturing lecturing type of talk your kid is not gonna listen to that i think coming from curiosity you Mm. know what happened knowing that kids will be kids and do if if it's like the l sign which in my book it's like kids are gonna be kids it's a harmless thing as opposed to calling someone the N-word in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. there is degrees of those things or calling someone a banana face. You can have a conversation with your kid, but not in a way that you're making them feel bad about themselves, right? Uh, so that they can be yeah. self-reflective and yeah. come to the conclusion on their own of what the right thing to do is. And I also think in situations like this, where if it's your kid who's the one who's being mean, I think we can apologize to the people who are having the, the meanness happening to, but also allowing your child to experience the natural consequences of that behavior is, is not a bad thing. So if Mm -hmm. she's being mean to everyone, pretty soon nobody is going to want to play with her. True. And then when that happens, we don't say, I told you so, or you should have been nice. Oh, really? I, because I have said that before, Laura. (laughs) Oh, well, it's, I told, no one uh, like loves a good, I told you so more than me. I love being right and being proven right, you know, but we got to stop ourselves, right? We have, we have to handle that with compassion, right? The, oh, they're not wanting to play with you. Oh, that must be so hard. I know how hard it is to feel lonely. What's going on? Why do you think they're saying no? And then maybe they'll say, well, you know, she sh- told me that, I was mean to her and she doesn't want to play with people who are mean. And, oh, I thought that was hard to hear, you know, like what happened, you know, and just get curious. Like you keep saying, I think curiosity is one of our biggest superpowers, but like 
helping them sit in that place of like, man, I screwed up and now I don't have any friends and this sucks. I I often talk to my daughter about hypothetical situations like that because she conveys to me certain things about social media, text messages, group messages, they're removing someone, blocking someone, things of that nature. And Mm. instead of saying, that's not good. That's not nice. You know, I don't want to be that mom of, uh, you know, throwing evaluative judgments around. I ask my daughter, hypothetical situations, placing her in the midst of a receiving end situation. I say, how would you have reacted if somebody blocked you? How would you feel if somebody, you know, you were a part of a group chat and then all of a sudden they removed you or they did this, they did that you know, Mm -hmm. hypothetical situations. And I let my daughter reflect upon those situations. And sometimes she's like, I don't care, whatever. I don't care. Let them do that. But I know down inside, she is thinking about it. As the surface, she says, I don't care. They can do whatever they want. I I don't want to be their friends either. But I know I am planting the seeds of self-reflection of that situation may happen to you too, kids. So expand your horizon a little bit. See from a different child's perspective, you know, because children can be a little like self-centered. They may not be able to see the other side. So I always invite my daughter to play with hypothetical situations and place her on the receiving end of meanness, hurt, bullying, and stuff like that. Because recently she she said that, mom, you won't believe what happened. One of the girls, because of some social media bullying, she attempted to commit suicide and now she's in, in, in a hospital, in a mental hospital. And my daughter was telling this story like in a matter of factly way. And I said, whoa, wait a minute this is serious stuff. You can't just be so dismissive and and factual about this. This is someone's life. This is a little kid. And so we had like long discussions about this. Uh, she's like, yeah, she was always unstable. Everybody knew and, and stuff like that. I said, even so, do you think it was fair knowing that she was unstable? People bullied her. And and she finally understood the connection that, yes, your actions online on social media can have an impact on someone on the other side that that can end really harmfully. You know, it doesn't have to be like my kid has to experience that in order for me to have a conversation. You know, the point I'm making here is you can also use hypothetical situations like a training purposes, Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And that, that defensive reaction or like, oh, I wouldn't care. Like, Mm -hmm. I think they have to have that. They have like, Mm-hmm. that's the discomfort. That, that keeping that's the, the front. That, the front. They that, have that are to. strong. Yes. Yeah. And you don't have to make them say, like yes. you don't have to convince them. They already know. They know. Good. You, yes. You know, and it, it, you can just say, hmm. okay. And, yeah. then, you know, and, and let like, let the, like the fact that they say they wouldn't care go because they would, you know, that they would, mm-hmm. or maybe they're developing a really good, strong sense of self and they wouldn't care if they were excluded. Like that would be great too, you know? So, mm-hmm. but yeah. they are reflecting. There's, they're saying that defensively because it's hard to th- look at yourself and realize you've made a mistake. Mm. Okay, so we have one last question uh, from Elizabeth asking about um, her child who's lost his favorite pet. Um, Her son has um, a very hard time with big feelings and the pet that he lost is the one who's been there for him, so affectionate, um, calms him when he's upset, um, comforts him when he needs extra comfort. And so losing this pet has been a very big blow for her son. Well, oftentimes it could be our children's uh, first loss, right? Experiencing loss of a pet um, as their first loss and how you deal and handle and help them go through it. It could be significant in how sort of they will handle grief and loss in the future. It's like becomes ingrained in them. Uh, I have several thoughts. I wish I knew a little more about how the pet died. Was it an accident? Was was it a dying pet? Because those things make a difference. Was it a shock death, right? Was it killed on the street by a car? Or was it a sick pet that you put to sleep? You know, that makes a difference. So because I don't know that, uh, so I have to 
say a few general things. Children will have a lot of emotions and grieving is not a linear process as, as we mm. know. You know, there are different stages of grief, but we don't complete first stage, second stage, third stage. It's not that simple. What I would say is uh, when the child wants to talk about it, you, you know, invite that conversation, join in. Uh, you can cry together. You can share great memories together. Don't try to bury the pain or not talk about it or postpone the conversation. If the child is ready in the moment and they want to share something, let that happen uh, to the extent that they are willing to share. By sharing it, by speaking about it more and more, the child will eventually make peace with it. Uh, they will go through different stages, different emotions from sadness, frustration, irritation, anger. They may have the denial phase, the first uh, stage of uh, sort of grief process, the disbelief, this didn't happen, or they will have also thoughts that, I could have done something. Why didn't I feed my pet better? Like remorse. That's also a normal part of the grieving process. Mm -hmm. Anger towards the universe or towards the, you know, the doctor perhaps who put the pet, pet to sleep or the driver who killed the pet uh, or just anger in general. It doesn't have to be directed to someone or a specific purpose. So there's a lot of emotions, but children can also withdraw and not show those emotions. Uh, and so you have to go with your child and honor your child's timing. Know that healing means closure plus time equals healing. So your child has to not only have time to go through the experience of grieving about the pet, but also has to have closure in order for the healing to happen. Happen. And it can be anywhere, you know, from three months, six months to a year. And after several months, this child may not exhibit any sadness or anything like that. But that doesn't mean that the pain went away, right? Uh, it may come again during the birthday or some kind of milestone anniversary or something like that. Um, or even when he just sees a picture of the, of, pet. Of, of, the, of the pet or something that reminds him of the pet, something like that. But try not to replace the pet, you know, by saying, oh, don't worry, we'll get you another pet or something like that, which I know, you know, most parents will not do. Replacing or burying the pain is never good. Art is good. If a child has a hard time speaking or they're very young, uh, about their feelings uh, about the pet, they can draw their feelings. They can, mm -hmm. you know, draw pictures with their pets. You can have pictures. You can establish safety for them to feel and express. That's the main thing. And it will go eventually into this acceptance phase of, of grief and, and children will make peace with it. And the child can write a letter to the pet what I miss about my pet or dear pet. It depends, again, on the age of the child. There's different rituals you can do together or help your child to do those rituals alone. But the main thing, I, I think, is to go with your child, not to rush the process, you know, don't probe too much. Don't say, Here, now I'm going to help my child heal with this and, you know, let's talk about this. Don't have an agenda about it. It's, it's a more natural process and, and be with it. And children sometimes can do illogical things to deal with the, with the loss of a pet. Now, did you have a pet growing up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Did, I did, did. Did you lose it? That's yes. Funny. Yeah. You know, so this is funny because in my family, we always have a dog. Um, it's always the same breed and coloring and always has the same name. <laughs> We've had like four coconuts. <laughs> Oh, why is that? You never dealt with the grief? Uh, you know, it's funny. Like, I, I think that my dad actually has a really hard time dealing. With and, you know, he was a young, when he was young, he lost his older brother um, to a car oh. accident and his mother had a very hard time dealing with that grief. And I think grief mm. is something that is very difficult for my dad. And so whenever he loses a dog, he just gets another one. And oh. you know, <laughs> that's exactly the same. And that's the same name. I mean, and it's a, it seems strange to outsiders and it doesn't, it doesn't feel strange to me um, because he 
was always very like open with the grief. Like we always buried our dogs in the prairie. My dad always planted a tree or something special over top of their graves to remember them. So he, he absolutely helped me learn how to grieve in a, in an authentic and connected way. Um, so it didn't feel yucky or like we were replacing at all. It just, oh, I see, um, I see. it meant it felt like honoring our, maybe. Yeah. Our so pet. that's yeah, for, like for us. Yeah. Um, but I do have some things too, though. I think that can help. It. I think you're so right on to follow your kid's lead in this scenario mm-hmm. um, to just trust them to grieve in their own space and their own time. And then when they come to you or when you see it bubbling up to hold space for it, I think parents sometimes can be grieving themselves and it's hard to hold space for someone else's grief when we're grieving ourselves too. And so like making sure you're taking care of yourself and that your grief is being supported by somebody who's linear with you and other adults so that you aren't getting support, like emotional support from your child so that it's a unidirectional support. You're offering support down to your children and you are getting support from people who are on the same level as you, um, I think is an important thing. There's a great little book called The Invisible String, which I think is a really important book and concept right now anyway, because we're all separated a lot Mm -hmm. from the people that we love. But in the book, they mention loss to us and how we can still be connected to the people um, and animals that we love um, even when we're separated. And there's also a poem that will make you cry when you read it <laughs> or if you're a tearful person like I am. Um, so if you Google the rainbow bridge and the phrase pet loss, you'll find it. Um, I would read it to yourself first before reading it to your child to just see. But the concept is, is that there is a, a place where pets wait for us. Um, and oh. reunited with them. Oh, I remember when my daughter lost her pet. We had it for a month only. It was a little hamster mm. and uh, it died in her hands. You know, it, it was really, I thought it was going to be more traumatic, but in actuality, it wasn't. So you that's what I'm saying. You have to know your child and also how long this pet was part of your life. Like for us, it was just a month old hamster and it died, you know, but a cat, a dog, these are like family members, you know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. you have to have rituals to honor them, to remember them, to bury them and stuff like that. And I think like getting curious with your kid, what would feel good to you? How would it, how would you like to remember him? What, what, Mm -hmm. what are your ideas to keep his memory close? Um, Mm -hmm. Like get, like letting them lead that. So my dog that I had, like that my parents have um, is much beloved by my daughter. Um, And she's old, she's 14. She's not in great health. Her death will probably happen in the next year or two. Um, And so we're already preparing Ellie for that. She has a plan for like when it happens and what, how she wants to remember. She wants to like, sew a little like pillow and stuff it with the dog's hair. Like she has a whole plan for how she's planning to, to grieve. You know, I I mean, I I think we can, we can ask our kids, they know they, and that's another piece, like to circle it back to the beginning, like helping them stay in touch with their intuition and listen to themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you need? What would, what do you need right now? You know, how can I support you? Like the, they know, they, they know those things. We have that intuition. And my daughter created a little box uh, and she put this hamster's toys and the pictures that she had taken of the hamster and she decorated the box. These are all healing activities. Mm -hmm. When the child is doing this kind of things, decorating a card in the memory of the pet or uh, making a box or things of that nature, you know, helping our children with that, instead of saying, what are you doing? You know, stopping the process process is is never Mm -hmm. is never good so and the play too so and play it it could absolutely come out in his play you might see him playing puppy more often or you might see him burying things in sand more often you know like it can absolutely come out in symbolic um, or more obvious ways in play and make sure that you are giving ample opportunity for free play with you present and like holding space for the play. Um, you don't have to say anything or heighten anything. He's very wise. He 
kids are very wise in their play. They will play in just the way that they need to, to process the things. And we can trust them to do that. And all they need is us to be there present with them. And they will have conversations about death, dying, mm-hmm. loss, about other, like Jesus or characters from a movie. Uh, be ready for that too. I think children who go through loss, they're not going to talk about only about the lost pet or a grandma, right? Yeah. Uh, a specific loss that they had. They're going to try to connect to the larger meaning of death and loss. And mm-hmm. they're frequently, I know children sometimes draw their you know, a, a person on a cross or Christ or symbolic things that are connected to the larger meaning of mortality and, and death and things like that. So seeing that as, as also a window of conversation, of healing, of holding space is, is good too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think this is helpful. I love the questions. I want to encourage people to send us their question by email, info at authenticparenting.com or send a voicemail, 732-763-2576 or post it in our Facebook community or DM me. I mean, there, there is different ways people post their questions. We'll do another episode. But before we say goodbye, Laura, do you have any resource to share? Anything that you discovered, a new book, a podcast? cast or anything? Yeah. So a book that I have like recently rediscovered and kind of rekindled my love for is um, a parent effectiveness training. Um, it was like, it's like an oldie, but a goodie by Thomas it's, Gordon. You know? It is. It's a good um, one. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's so good. Um, so if, even if you've read it before, like get it back out and read it again, or if you need a more kind of, it's a, it's a kind of complicated book. It, takes a little bit of headspace. So if you need a kind of a more accessible version of the content in it, um, the How to Talk So Kids Will Listen series is always really good too. Yeah. And like, even if you've read them before, go back and read them again. Your kids are older. You are having new challenges. You'll find new things in them. Yes. I am rereading a book too by Bruce Perry. Uh, his, his book called A Boy Who Was Raised uh, as a Dog on Childhood Trauma, which mm. is more of a professional book. But I would recommend um, Netflix series. <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I've been I, I just devoured and enjoyed this Spanish show called Dark Desire. It's, 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 it's a really tantalizing, really good show. I posted on Instagram and another show that I'm enjoying on Amazon prime is the affair. So again, it's, it's about human relationships, divorce, affairs, loss, crime. It's, it's pretty fascinating. I have a show to share too. Go ahead. (laughs) Okay. Um, shits Creek. So it's spelled S C H I T T S (laughs) Creek. Oh my gosh. It's so good. It, you need to stick with it for the first like six episodes. Um, cause at the beginning it's the concept is that there's these, this family that are super rich and then they lose all their money and they have to go move into a small town called Shits Creek. And they, in losing all of their money and all their worldly possessions, they find each other and themselves. And it's oh. so beautiful. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Like wow. it's a beautiful show. Is um, it on Netflix? Yeah, yeah, it's on Netflix. And then the most recent season is on Hulu. So, oh. um, but yeah, it's it's so good. There's it's the character development and growth in it is beautiful, and it's also very intentionally like homophobia free. So there's one one of the main characters is pansexual um, and has it's one of the most beautiful depictions of a homosexual relationship of a of a gay relationship. It's just it's so normal. None of like this their romance is just a romance. It's not a story of their struggle or of uh, it like challenges that they face. It's just a beautiful romance, and so they you actually get to see. It's just love. You know, it's yeah. a beautiful, like there, there's so many, so many good layers to our Excellent. show. I'll check it out. Thanks for the recommendation. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, until next week. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.